Now, the 1970s come along, and there's a geologist by the name of Raymond Koxorowski out in South Carolina. And he wrote a book called The Origin of the Carolina Bays. And having, after having read his book, I concluded that his motive was that he knew that Douglas Johnson's theory had become had been invalidated. So he knew that sooner or later somebody was going to come back and revive this ridiculous extraterrestrial hypothesis. So he came up with a theory that was as equally as cobbled together as Douglas Johnson's. And that book came out in about 1976 to 1978, right in that time span. Well, with that book, that sort of like was now considered, well, here's the definitive, you know, maybe does it's not the definitive proof of how they got there, but at least it, it disproves the whole uh, extraterrestrial hypothesis, and we don't need to go back to that place. That was sort of the attitude. And if you look at most of the writing in the 70s and the 80s and even into the early 90s on the bays, most of them will make, well, the theories of the Carolina Bays are, are numerous, and there were numerous theories, probably 10 or 12 different theories. But what they'll say is they'll, you know, one guy, you know, one geologist theorized that it was uh, schools of fish swimming in a circle. I mean, that was, that was one of them, okay, and that was probably one of them. And, and, and another one was that it was this big meteorite strike. <laughs> and so they would mention, you know, the, the schools of fish swimming in a circle in the same breath, as as this meteor as the meteorite strike, almost to you know guilt by association, so that, well, as ridiculous as as schools of fish swimming in an ellipse in a circle, so is this idea that it could have been formed by something from outer space for crying out loud. That was the prevailing attitude. These people went to college. Yeah, mm -hmm. presumably, and they were in, they were well they went to college and they had they were indoctrinated into the dogmas of uniformitarianism that basically says you have to, if you're going to look at anything out there in the natural world and try to explain its origin, you can only do so by relying upon forces and things that we see operating in the present day. And we've never seen a Carolina Bay being formed in the present day. That's the problem. Koxorowski, what he did, he said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to go and look and find present day analogs, modern analogs. And he makes this bold statement in the introduction to his work. And then he cites three examples, right? The problem is, is that the three examples he cites are not modern day analogs at all. Like for example, he cites the Oriented Lakes of Alaska. But if you then go and you read the literature, and I'm going to show you some pictures of the Oriented Lakes, if you go and read the literature on the Oriented Lakes of Alaska, what they're saying is, oh, these things were formed at least 10 to 20,000 years ago during the Ice Age. <laughs> But here's Koxorowski saying, well, we're going to go and look at modern analogs, and we can see that these lakes are forming. We don't need to talk about things from space. So there it remained, okay, and with a few exceptions, Bob Cobers out at the University of Georgia at Athens uh, was one of the researchers who maintained the idea that these things were extraterrestrial uh, oh, yeah. in origin. There was a book written in 1976 on a, by a German physicist, some of you may have seen it or read it, on, on Atlantis. I think it was called The Secret of Atlantis by Otto Mook. Anybody heard of that one? Otto Mook. He was a German physicist. He wrote this book on Atlantis. And in the, in the book, he theorizes that Atlantis was sunk because a six-mile-wide asteroid fell into the Atlantic Ocean at the, at the end of the last ice age. And he has a section in there on the Carolina, this is where I first heard of the Carolina Bays, which was probably, I guess I, the book came out in 76, and I think I probably read it in 79 or 80. And he has a short section in there on the Carolina Bays, and he says there was evidence that perhaps, you know, these Carolina Bays were formed by uh, a meteorite strike, a, a multiple meteorite strike, or a disintegrating comet, or pieces of a breaking up asteroid. And he said, in there, this, this is evidence that supports what I'm saying, that there was a six mile asteroid that fell into the... Now, of course, we now know from the physics that if a, if a six mile asteroid had fallen into the Atlantic Ocean, we wouldn't be here. The, 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 the environmental consequences would have been so severe that it would have probably caused the extermination of humanity. 
if a six mile, a six mile asteroid, okay. But in any case, he 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 invoked these Carolina Bays <laughs> as as evidence in support of this idea that he was proposing that that this asteroid had fallen into the Atlantic Ocean and caused tidal waves and earthquakes, and that's what sunk Atlantis. So that was my first exposure to it. Now, about that time, I also read another book called, um, another book, I was researching Atlantis at the time, and there was another book, and I would recommend it. It's called, I forget, the, it's something Atlantis. It's by Cedric Leonard. He's a British author, Cedric Leonard. And he, inv he goes into a lot of linguistic evidence and symbolical evidence, but he has a chapter in there entitled, the Cataclysm of 10,000 B.C. And he basically says there is geological evidence that there was a great cataclysm about 10,000 B.C., which puts it right in the period of time that would be appropriate for Plato's date of the sinking of Atlantis. Well, in this chapter, the Cataclysm of 10,000 B.C., he makes a brief mention of the Great Missoula Flood. Now, I had never heard of the Missoula Flood, to my memory I had never, until I read Cedric Leonard's book. However, I had traveled across the Channel Scablands and had traveled down the Columbia Gorge and across that region in the summer of 1970. So I had seen that land and been very impressed by it, but had no idea what the story was at all. So when I read Cedric Leonard's book, I thought, yeah, I, I remember that. I remember crossing that, and I remember... You know, but he mentions, I'm pretty sure he mentions in there the conventional theory that it was caused by a large lake held in by a glacial dam that broke loose and the water flowed out. So I accepted that for the time, right? But I stored this idea of the Missoula Flood in the back of my mind, and I continued researching the Carolina Bays. And I think, Jeremy, what year was that when you and I went down and did the <coughs> overflight in South Georgia? Do you remember? Maybe 92? About 92, yeah, that seems about right. So about, about 92, me and Jeremy and somebody else. Uh, uh, David Fulman. Yeah, we went down and we hired a pilot and got him to fly us over some of the Carolina Bays of Georgia. So I know that by 92 I had been researching them pretty thoroughly. Well... To make a long story short, I started thinking, let's let's rethink this whole thing about, you know, meteorite strike versus terrestrial stuff. So what I do is I set out to read and study every single thing that had been written on the Carolina Bays, which probably by 92 I think I had done. Pretty much read all of it. There's one book, this, if, if you want to get the, the best overview is... I think, I don't know if it's still available, but The Mysterious Carolina Bays by Henry Savage, Jr. Okay, so the date on this... Henry uh, who? What? Henry who? Henry Savage, Jr. Um, I think the date on the book was about 19... Yeah, his foreword here is dated 1981. In this book, Henry Savage introduces both the general reader and the scientist to the physical, chemical, and biotic characteristics of the Carolina Bays, and to the development of scientific thought about their origin. Mr. Savage's bibliography will be particularly valuable. As far as I know, it is the only published listing that attempts to record everything that has been written about the Carolina Bays. <clears throat> so I used his bibliography, and then through interlibrary loan and visiting various universities, I think I was pretty much able to acquire copies of almost everything that had been written on the subject, which I then studied in detail over the next year or two. And that was about the time that Jeremy and I went and did the overflight. Get down the well, let's see. Here's, here's a map of South Georgia. Let's see here. Uh, Okay, so here's Atlanta. Now, they're, they're scattered across, but there's a particular cluster, a, a concentrated cluster within that red ellipse that I've drawn there. Right. And we were in that area. I'm pretty sure it was in, yeah. See, here's, here's the Georgia-Florida line. So the area that we flew over was in this ellipse right here. 
Adel, yeah, okay, Adel is where we flew out of, right there, the Cook County Airport, that's where we flew out of. Uh -huh. well, it looks like there's one right there. <laughs> well, there is, that's one right yeah. there. That's Here's a, one here, you can see, yeah, there's a bunch of them, small ones. You go right by on the interstate there at 75, yeah. right there on the edge of that, that you one. Can see it that's it right there. You can see it though. You yeah, it's, it's, different. Well, it's, a big, it's a big round it's lake. Very it's very obvious, a, yeah. roads don't go across any of them. Right. <laughs> Well, there's No Man's Friend Pond, which uh, this one right here is that right there. Oh, yeah. It's a good school. It's yeah. <laughs> well, like good farming with peat and everything. If it's not oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it is. I mean, and that's why a lot of them have been destroyed is because of it for agricultural purposes. Well, when you look at this, um, here is, uh, this is on the moon, twin craters. Now, this crater here is elliptical, very much like a Carolina Bay. What does the ellipticity indicate? Well, as it says right there, indicates an oblique impact, meaning coming in at a shallow angle. Coming in at a shallow angle, exactly. And then, of course, when you're looking at actual, what are acknowledged to be craters, we find this same type of phenomena that we see with the bays, where you might have one crater rim encroaching upon another, which doesn't really tell you how much time elapsed between successive craters, but it tells you for sure that this one is younger than this one. Yeah. Well, you could tell by right. the first one about how, how degraded it is, you know, if it's totally washed out and starting to, well, versus the new one. On the moon, good. see, there's very little erosion on the moon. Yes. In fact, the only erosion is on that occurs on the moon is when the next impact event occurs. Yeah. But, like, look up here. Here's another, see, here's a crater within a crater. So when you actually start studying craters, you notice that there are a lot of parallels between what are acknowledged and recognized to be craters and the Carolina Bays. Okay, look right there. There's the distribution of the Carolina Bays after Prouty. So here you can see Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and all of this speckly stuff in here is the bays. Now here, this line here represents the fall line which separates the coastal plain from the Piedmont. Well, it's, it's important to note here that all of the bays are concentrated between the coastline and the fall line. And in those ghost bays that I showed you, that's what happens when you start leaving the sandy coastal plain and get up, under, up onto the rocky high, higher land of the Piedmont that is separated here by this fall line. Now, it was assumed, even by Henry Savage in this book, even the guys who accepted the celestial hypothesis assumed that the strike was limited to the coastal plain. You see? My thinking, as I started thinking through it, I was thinking, well, especially when I discovered, the same question that Elizabeth asked. Is there evidence that they were under the ocean? That's precisely the thought that I was thinking, and then I realized, well, because of the fact that if they occurred during the late Pleistocene, sea levels were 350 or 400 feet lower, that meant that the, that the coastline, instead of being here, was you know, out here somewhere. Well, is it possible then that there were Carolina Bays out here? Well, the problem with that seemed to be that, well, when the sea level rose, it probably would erase whatever Carolina Bays would have existed out there. So we don't know whether that, if it, if it was in fact a strike, whether it did extend out into the ocean. Was it confined to the coastal plain, or were there the same thing up here? Well, you know, when you look at Tunguska, one of the lessons we learned from Tunguska is a hundred years later now, the evidence that there had been this aerial explosion that flattened the forest, you know, well, the, the lesson there is that Within a few centuries, the evidence is probably just is gone, right? Except where you have the coastal plain, where it's sandy, unconsolidated sediments. That's an important point in trying to understand this phenomenon. But then when I discovered the, the, the ghost bays, 
and realized, well, those ghost bays might be evidence that this bombardment actually extended up here, but the, the rockier, harder ground is not conducive to the formation of the shallow depressions. So keep that in mind. This is how my thinking worked, okay? Now, we should jump back to Tunguska very quickly and briefly because Tunguska provides <coughs> us with some important lessons. Here we go. All right. Let's briefly look at Tunguska. Here we go. Under the Tunguska explosion, what do you suppose they found? Peat. Dead trees. The Suslov Hole in May of 1929 after being drained. Look at this thing. Look at that thing. Let's see what else we've got here. How did they drain it? They dug a, a ditch, I think, to a nearby stream. And it flowed out? And it flowed out, yeah. So, but this one oh. isn't circular. This is like a butterfly. Well, that's, well, however, let me get to that. Let's see, go back here. Okay, here, this is what I was looking for. This is ground zero. And basically what you have here is you had a extremely hot thermal pulse that hit the ground at this point and incinerated everything between this hill and the foreground. There's, there's just nothing there. Everything was essentially just burned completely to nothing. Around that you had a ring of standing trees because what happened was this pulse, this, this shock wave of heat hit the ground that remember, the explosion was five miles in the air. That's mm -hmm. the estimates. This tremendous hot pressure wave hit the ground, flattened the forest out in all directions, but right at the center, it incinerated everything. <clears throat> right? How big do they think that the meteor was? I mean, 150 feet in diameter. That's all? That's all. Whoa, that's frightening. And it's, it's, the energy released when it exploded was about equivalent to a 15 to 20 megaton hydrogen bomb. Now how, how much energy is in a 15 to 20 megaton hydrogen bomb? A lot, yeah. Um, so when, when you have a comet or meteors, do they tend to be the six mile biggies or are most of them smaller? No, this is a very good question. The bigger they are, the more rare they are. So the smaller they are, the more abundant they are. Okay. Just think about things like what's more abundant, elephants or mice? Okay. You know? So you're saying small from what size down to what? 150 well, down to... Here's a, here's a good, good thing to keep in mind. When you get below about 50 feet in diameter, there's no surface effects. Now you've got to bear in mind that when we're talking about these things, the the range of, of different animals that can possibly, cosmic beasts that can encounter the Earth range from extremely low density comet type materials that are like frozen ice mainly, with, with about the density of ice, to the other end of the spectrum you have these iron asteroids that are like, like the, the density of cast iron. And then you've got a whole range of stuff in between from about one gram per cubic centimeter, the density of water, to about five grams or six grams per cubic centimeter, which is going to be like the density of heavy cast iron. The assumption of the Tunguska is that it was towards the lower end of the spectrum, probably two to three grams per cubic centimeter, perhaps the density of a fairly <coughs> porous rock. Right Now, a rock, like you might pick up a normal river rock, is going to be about in the middle. You've got an ice chunk here, you've got cast iron on this end, and you've got a rock in the middle. Tunguska was considered to be like a fairly low-density rock. If it had been higher density, the object that struck in Arizona that created the crater, the famous crater that I've shown you pictures of that's in Arizona. Behringer. Behringer Crater. They estimate that that was about 150 feet in diameter, about the same size as Tunguska. But, but what was the difference? The difference was density. 
The object that struck in Arizona was an iron object, hard, dense, able to penetrate completely through the atmosphere and strike the ground. Tunguska was a lower density object. It did not, it was not able to penetrate the full thickness of the atmosphere. The atmosphere piled up in front of it and at about five miles up, it just turned inside out and exploded and released all its kinetic energy. So how much of the possibles, iron to rock to ice, where are most of them? Are they more ice? Most of them are clustered in the middle, the yeah. stony <coughs> objects, okay. yes. That's also a very significant fact. So the, the skillet, the iron, is rare and the ice is rare. <coughs> yes. Okay. The objects that are several hundred feet in diameter that can leave impact scars on the surface of the earth, mm -hmm. where we can come along and look at a big hole in the ground, they're about 10 to 15 percent in terms of the numbers compared to the lighter weight stony objects that would do like Tunguska that would blow up in the atmosphere and not hit the ground. That's a very significant fact. Yeah. You mentioned that this was all charred on the edge. Yeah. Wouldn't it be charred in the middle? Isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah, it's charred in the middle. In the debris in the middle? Yes, that's permafrost that got melted in the process and the trees were burned off but as the shock wave just outside of that area is where this ring of standing trees are that have been stripped of their branches because as the shock wave it was coming down more or less vertical so in the middle where it was this extreme thermal pulse everything got burned as you move away from the epicenter to lower temperatures things got scorched but not incinerated so then you have where the shock wave came vertically and didn't knock the trees over. It stripped their branches and bark yeah, off, but left a ring of standing trees. Now when you get outside the ring of the standing trees, they're all laid out like matchsticks, just blown over like you saw you know, in these <clears throat> pictures. Here's a picture taken uh, in, 19, in the 1980s. And these were trees that were blown down in 1908. And there's another view of the cauldron, as it's called. But now, what I want to get to is these curious holes that they found under there. Take a look. Now, here's... It's not a very good photograph, and I don't have... And part of the problem is it's all grown over now, so you can't see these things so much anymore. But take a look at what you have. You have multiple clusterings of these shallow elliptical depressions. Okay, this is the, this is the cauldron as it appeared in the 1980s. So this, this was the epicenter here, and you can see it's growing back. But let's get to this. Now here you can see some of the swampy things. You see there's part of one, you can make it out out here, and then this, but let's see, there's a better photograph. Yeah, here we go. And see, this is what, one of the small, neat, oval bogs that Kulik erroneously presumed to be secondary craters of the fragmented meteorite. This one was named after the ethnographer Sluis Suslaw. Well, if you look at this thing, it has all of the characteristics of the Carolina Bay. But just as with the Carolina Bays, remember, the critics said, well, these aren't meteorite holes because there's no meteorites in them. Well, that's what this guy essentially is saying. He's saying, well, Kulik er erroneously assumed that this was some kind of a secondary meteor crater, but there was no meteorite found in it. Therefore, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. But, and here you can kind of see the thing. You see, here what you had was you had a blast wave, a, a, a wave of compressed presumably compressed air that struck the permafrost and literally pushed it, pushed it, you know, into this rim that you see here, into an oval or elliptical shape. So there is a characteristic associated with the Tunguska event that is very suggestive of what we're seeing at the Carolina Bays. There are shallow elliptical depressions associated with the Tunguska explosion. Almost as if perhaps the initial object blew up and then there were smaller objects that, that it didn't completely vaporize. Smaller secondary objects penetrated deeper into the atmosphere and perhaps, and, and really from the eyewitness accounts, it sounds like 
It wasn't one big explosion, but a big explosion followed by multiple smaller explosions. Here is, I know I've shown this before, but some of you haven't seen it. This is the area of devastation of the, of the uh, let me back it up here. Okay, what you can see here is Atlanta. And of course, this is 285 here. So what I've done is overlaid the area of devastation on the map of it so you can really get a sense of how, really what an extraordinary explosion that was. Does that indicate it was coming in at an angle also? Yes, yes. And in fact, the butterfly pattern probably suggests that the initial object split like a microsecond first and then they both exploded and this the lines represent the radial tree fall this is the cauldron or the epicenter the area where everything was essentially burned off so that would be that explosion was like I said about equivalent to a 15 to 20 megaton nuclear bomb and we have tested, America has tested bombs of that size. Well, let's see here if we can find a 15 megaton. Now, see, now that's only 32 kilotons there, so that's, that's minuscule. Yeah. 44 kilotons, yeah, this, this is nothing here. This is, this is, this is exploded. 11 kilotons. Now, what, it, to, what is a kiloton? A kiloton is 1,000 tons of TNT. So this would mean 210,000 tons of TNT would make an explosion that big. Okay, here now we're getting into the range of the Tunguska explosion. This is 10, this is megatons. Megatons is a million tons of TNT. So this would be 10 million 400,000 tons of TNT made this explosion right here. And now, they do this in the ocean or what? Well, let's see. Mike was, I think, on an atoll in the Pacific what? Ocean, an atoll. What is that? A coral atoll. Coral atoll. That would have been, that was 1952. Area. Randall? Yes. I was living in San Francisco in the 80s. Yeah. And every time they would do underground testing in Nevada, uh -huh. Within three days, we would have an earthquake in San Francisco. I certainly, Without I believe fail. that. Without fail. This yep. was done in Annie mm -hmm. Weetal, by the way. I believe that's correct. They're not doing it anymore in that, are they? No, they're not doing it. No. no. Not supposed to we be. haven't done a, a, an aerial, an above-ground nuclear test since 1963. What about below ground? Well, they weren't. They went right on up through the Reagan administration in the 1980s. And now it stopped? Yes. Oh, in other countries? Oh, who was the last one? I don't... China, probably, yeah, or yeah, India? No, India, India or Pakistan. Pakistan. Yeah. So this is another view of a 10 megaton explosion. And here we're up, yeah. you know, above the cloud layer. There's a 500 kiloton. So if you look at that explosion, the Tunguska explosion was probably 30 to 40 times more powerful than what you see right there. So... This is interesting. To, this kind of puts it in a perspective for us because when we start looking at the largest nuclear bombs detonated by human beings, and see here, this is a mere one and one and a half megatons. So it looked it was a thousand times greater than Nagasaki or Hiroshima. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this. You know what's so bizarre is how beautiful these things are. Oh, I know. They're they're, really they're yeah. Ugly. It's really. Well, you look at this. Now, here's 11 megatons. So this is getting up into the ballpark of the Tunguska explosion. Oh, yeah. What I was about to say was that, you know, man now has learned how to detonate, you know, how, how to, to use nuclear energy to create uh, explosions that approach the range. Almost like when we start looking at, at, at the amounts of energy that we can manipulate and release, from, say, an atomic bomb up through a large hydrogen bomb. And when we're talking megatons, we're talking hydrogen bombs. When we look at that scale of energies that we can release, when we get to the top end of that scale, we're basically at the bottom end of the cosmic scale. In other words, Tunguska represents a, just a small little piece of cosmic dust, essentially, that 
that happened into the Earth's atmosphere. 150 foot rock, like you said, is that all? Right? Mm -hmm. So, what we have now done, mankind has, has learned to manipulate energies that have just reached the bottom threshold of cosmic energies.